Welcome, 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 friend. I'm TK, your tour guide to the past, and you are listening to For the Love of History, the podcast where we talk about world history, women's history, and weird history. Happy Valentine's Day, my delicious little donut. And look at the earrings that I found at a secondhand store when I was back home in Idaho. They're donuts, and they're perfect, and they're my favorite earrings in the whole world, and they're vaguely Valentine's-y. So that's why I wore them. I hope Valentine's Day uh, was everything that you hoped it would be. And if it wasn't, we have a great episode for you today to help you forget all about that wretched, wretched holiday. Because who needs chocolates when you have a story about a Chinese goddess of war and smexy time. But before we get into that, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. So first thing I'd like to tell you about is the History BFF Travel Meet Up. We tried to do this last year, but unfortunately it was just bad timing. I was moving, starting a new job, lots of things were going on. So we had to push it back a little bit. However, we are trying again this year and I'm very excited about it. So if you are interested in traveling with me and other delicious donuts to a history filled location, It would be lovely if you could take some time. It takes literally two minutes to go fill out that survey, which is in the show notes below. And if traveling isn't in the cards for you anytime soon, that's totally okay. And you can still fill out the survey because this will be not the only, not, (laughs) will will not be the only. We're not just going to have one. We're going to do multiple is what I'm trying to say if there's more interest. And of course you can have your input heard because I will be taking you with me virtually. So once again, the survey is in the show notes and all over Instagram and my social medias. And by filling it out, it really helps get this trip off the ground. And our second order of business is if you haven't yet, it would be super cool if you could head on over to For the Love of History on YouTube and subscribe. It is one of the best free 99 ways to support For the Love of History. And I just wanted to let you know that not only episodes, podcast episodes will be uploaded. I believe there is already a travel vlog up there and soon there will be a food history video up there soon and then some reaction videos coming up. And it's it's very good, it's very good. <laughs> Lots of history content, you're gonna love it. And with that, let's get to the episode. So I heard you loud and clear in the 2023 slash 24 for the love of history community census. And there was a huge demand for more mythology and I'm here to provide that mythology content. And when I was searching through one of my favorite Chinese mythology books right here, I came across one of the most epic and cool goddesses ever from ancient China. And thankfully, you voted for her in the topic polls. I love when a good plan comes together. So now we are going to hop in our time machine, travel back to ancient China. So grab your snacks, grab a drink, and let's get to it. So before we dive into our story of Jiu Qian Shen Yu, let's dip our little toes into the water and get an understanding of Chinese mythology so that we can better understand the part that she plays. And as always, this is a very brief and by no means exhaustive history of Chinese mythology. So if you'd like more information, I left a bunch of resources in the show notes if you'd like to learn more. I think we can learn a lot about a culture's mythology and the culture itself from their creation story. So that's where we're going to start today. In the beginning, there was an egg floating around in space in the cosmic void that was the universe. Inside the egg was a little baby named Pengu, which is an adorable name for what is essentially a titan. Pengu spent thousands of years growing in his little egg, and so too did heaven and earth. All was right in the void, and he floated around the universe. Until, like all creatures, great and small, he got lonely and frustrated. Pengu became so upset that he cracked open the egg and out came the world. But heaven and earth had grown inside the egg and they wanted to be together. And chaos tried to take over. Pengu said, no thank you. I will not have chaos in my world. And he held heaven and earth apart for 18,000 years. Throughout those centuries, Pengu grew and so too did the earth. However, Pengu was not a god, but a giant. 
a titan of sorts, and eventually he became old and weak. Pengu passed away, but in so doing, his body became all the things that we know on Earth. His right eye became the sun, his left the moon, his beard turned to stars, and his muscles became the mountains. His blood flowed and turned to rivers, and his teeth became the precious metals and gems in the ground. And I thought about not including this part, but, you know, in respect for Sobek, our lord of baby gravy, and as like a little callback, I thought I would include this part. So um, Pengu's love juice, if you will, became the jade and pearls, which are the most precious of all things. I just don't understand why so many creation stories have to do with bodily fluids. Why? But why though? Can somebody give me an answer? How does one research that? Why? (laughs) Why are there so many bodily fluids? I guess... Life comes from bodily fluids. Ew, gross. Okay, nope, no, 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 no. We're moving on. We are moving on. Anyways, basically each part of him became a part of the earth and all its living things except for humans. One might think from this story that there were no gods or goddesses yet, but there most certainly were. While Pengu was creating Earth, some other gods and goddesses were watching him, and one goddess in particular, Nua, was so taken by the beauty of Earth that Pengu had created that she decided to make it her home. But Earth is quite a lonely place with no humans, so she picked up some clay and began forming people one by one. However, after a while, she got tired of it and she took a leather strap and she just dragged it through the mud and then started flinging it around and all of those little flung off pieces became humans. And I feel like each and every one of us know those two types of humans, the the carefully crafted ones and then the ones that are just like flung off the leather strap. Sometimes I feel like (laughs) the humans that are flung off the leather strap. Anyways, she made all of these humans, but they would live and eventually die, and she would need to make new ones. And once again, she got tired of making humans altogether, so she decided to give the humans a way to reproduce. She bestowed upon them the horizontal tango. And satisfied with her work, she retreated into the heavens, but had to come back one more time because of a giant flood that came and killed everybody except for a brother and sister pair who wanted to repopulate the world, which is a whole nother thing. So let's talk about these other gods. We've been introduced to Nua, the matriarch goddess figure, the creator of humanity, and Pengu, who's not a god, but a giant who falls more under the mythical creature category. In the Chinese pantheon, we have four main groups. We have mythological or heavenly deities, (laughs) deities, deities, like Pengu and Nua. Then we have deified humans, both legendary and historical. The Jade Emperor, who we're going to talk about a little bit more, falls under this category. And then we have nature spirits, such as gods and goddesses of rain, wind, trees, water bodies, mountains. Think more fairy, fey, nymphy than God. And finally, we have the deities specific to Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism. These can include mythical beings and other gods and goddesses from the previous categories, but not always, and more often than not, they are changed to fit in with the morals and tenets of the religion. The first myths, like most, were oral stories beginning sometime around the 12th century BCE, like 4,000-ish years ago, and it would be another century before they were written down in one of the oldest books in China, the Shanghai Jing, or the Mountain and Sea Scroll, which describes the myths, witchcraft, and religion of ancient China in very great detail, and also is a record of geography, seas, mountains, history, medicine, customs, ethics, and it's basically like an encyclopedia of ancient China, written in ancient China. And then we have the Shui Jing Zhu, which is the commentaries on the water scroll. It's also a collection of geography, history, and also legends. 
Government officials and priests also began writing something I like to call myth historical documents. And for hundreds of years, priests and historians were one in the same. There wasn't like a different genre for these types of writings, which is really common in a lot of countries. It's the same in Japan, the Nihon Shoki and the the other one that I can't remember in the name of right now, they're also myth historical. They have some historical events in it and some mythological legendary events in it. So for hundreds of years, priests and historians were one in the same and they were creating these myth historical documents. And this, dear one, is where we get our topic for today. Jotian Shen Yu has possibly the coolest name in all of mythology. When translated, Shen Yu means the Dark Lady or the Lady of Mystery. And Zhou Jian is a Taoist title given to her later on, which means of the nine heavens. So her name translates to Dark Lady of the Nine Heavens or Mysterious Lady of the Nine Heavens and she only gets cooler and more badass from here. The first priest to write about Zhou Jian Xin Yu was Du Guangting who wrote a biography about her. And in his biography, she first appears to Huangdi, the Jade Emperor, in the midst of battle. He's surrounded by a magic mist created by his enemy, and things look terribly bleak for the Emperor. So he calls up to the heavens to ask for help from his teacher, Zhou Tian. And she appears from the sky, on the back of a giant phoenix. And do you know how she's holding on to the giant phoenix? With phosphorus, like, chain thingies holding on to them. On top of this also flaming phoenix bird. In the novel, Outlaws of the Marsh by Xin Yang, she's described at this moment like this. On her head, she has a nine dragon and flying phoenix top knot. On her body, she wears a red silken gown decorated with golden thread. Blue jade-like strips run down the long gown and white ritual objects rise above her colored sleeves. Her face is like a lotus and her eyebrows fit naturally with her hair. Her lips are like cherries and her snow white body appears elegant and relaxed. She is a total babe. And I would love to be described as both elegant and relaxed and looking relaxed while diving out of heaven down on to earth, riding atop of a flaming bird. That's like, that's pretty, that's pretty stinking cool. She's already just like chef's kiss, chef's kiss of a goddess. I love her. So in the story, when she reaches the Jade Emperor, just in the nick of time, she gives him some spell books, amulets, and temporarily bestows upon him her secret powers. And what might those secret powers be, you ask, dear one? Well, they are the secret powers of invisibility. So Our Lady of Darkness and Mystery is an incredible strategist, and one of the things that makes her so good is her ability to become invisible. And not just physically invisible, but spiritually, metaphysically, and physically invisible. And she has a posse of six jade warrior maidens that accompany her on this invisibility process. And I just want to pause for a moment to think about and acknowledge how freaking cool it is that we have seven women who are in this posse of badass warriors. I love it. It's amazing. Anyways, so according to the Ling Bao Luing Ding Mifa, an ancient Chinese text written by an unknown author, the Jade Maidens perform specific tasks during the concealment invisibility process. The Jade Maiden of Ding Mao conceals one's physical body. The Maiden of Ding Si conceals one's destiny. The Maiden of Ding Hai conceals one's fortune. Ding Yu conceals one's Han soul, and Ding Wei conceals one's Po soul, and the Jade Maiden of Ding Chu conceals one's spirit. 
You got two different kinds of souls up there and both of them are equally important in the concealment process, apparently. And they don't all have to work at the same time. You can conceal different parts of yourself depending on the situation. Like when fighting a spiritual battle, being able to hide your soul is a game changer. And when you're in a mortal physical battle, invisibility is a huge benefit. If Lord of the Rings has taught us anything, it's that even a little hobbit can do a lot of damage when invisible and having the ability to bestow the invisibility on others is like a billion times more helpful and super cool. But her powers didn't stop there. In many legends, Zhou Tian Shen Yu advises the Jade Emperor, supports him, and teaches him battle strategies and leadership, and guides him in becoming the golden standard of emperor that all emperors strove to be for thousands of years. Now, we're not exactly sure if the Jade Emperor was a real person or if he's more like an Arthurian character. So that's why he falls under the deified human human category in the Chinese pantheon. But in all of the stories, his deification is directly linked with Zhou Tian. And her council didn't just begin and end on the battlefield, nay nay dear one. She also advised him in matters of nighttime shenanigans. To Zhou Tian Xin Yu, adult fun time was just as much a part of strategy as deciding where to put your soldiers. Deciding where to put your other things in other places was just as important, but she was like a businesswoman about it. In the book, she tells the Jade Emperor that no pants parties are like the intermingling of water and fire. It can kill or bring life depending upon whether or not one uses the correct methods. TM, Zhou Tian Shen Yu. <laughs> and just a side note, I feel like that would be a perfect line for one of those fairy smut books, or any smut books for that matter. And if there are any smut authors who are out there, or smut fanfic authors that are out there, and you use that line, Make sure that you credit me and Joti and Shane you, okay? Because <laughs> it's so good. That would be a really good line. But I digress. Now might be a good time to send the children out of the room or put your headphones in because we've come to the to the uh, the sex part of the sex god. <laughs> Just so you know. Anyways, I didn't know this before I started my research, but the Taoists. Not all of them. Many Taoists practice sex magic, and uh, Zhou Qianxian Yu is very much at the center of it. Several texts have been written all the way back in the Sui Dynasty, which is four-ish thousand, three, 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 four thousand years ago, until the Han Dynasty, which describes sexuality and the roles it plays in spiritualism. One called the Dong Zhuanzi. Feng Zhou Shu was written in the 7th century and contains extremely explicit descriptions of the sexual arts that involve healing, focus, energy, conservation, and renewal. You see, traditional Chinese medicine has three parts. The Zhu Yu, which is spell casting, the Ying Ji, which is Chinese medicine, and the Fang Zhong Shu, which is sexual skills and methods, which include idea transfer, suppression, which is like, like, you know, suppressing, not not coming to fruition, fruition, which is, you know, okay, love that. Interruption, which is you, you're, you're in, you're in it, and then you're not, and you do it on purpose. Um, and then special postures, a la 
Kama Sutra and then touching the three peaks and I'll let you take a take a guess at what the three peaks are. Oh my gosh. So each one of these three branches was of equal importance in ancient China and even to some practitioners today. I read a very interesting article from the World Journal of Men's Health about the uh, Chinese medicine practices using these suppression and interruption and posture methods for premature cometh to with fruition, um, if you will, in men, which gotta love that. <laughs> and I, I can hear you. I hear your questions coming in through the ether. TK, how the heck is Our Lady of Darkness and Mystery involved with this? Well, dear one, she she is in many of the books and there are a few that are named after her or contain her name within the title and in the books she's the one teaching the methods and the techniques and it's wild because in many of these books the no pants dance is compared to alchemy and is responsible for prolonging life. Essentially, the Holy Grail, the fountain of youth, not the creation of life, friend. Nua was, she's, she's got that under control. Our Lady of Darkness and Mystery of the Nine Heavens is responsible for longevity and is never referred to as a fertility goddess until later on, but we'll talk about that, and is strictly in charge of the late night downstairs disco. During this time, she was sexually empowered, in control of her own body, and taught others to do and be the same. But unfortunately, garbage humans are gonna garbage, and her connection with sexuality was slowly erased. In Taoism, sexuality is great. We love love. They love love. It's wonderful. It's a part of the practice. But in Taoism, when Taoism took over in China during the Tang Dynasty, 618 to 907, they had very different feelings about women and men and how they should be using their bodies. Many Taoist priests and scholars began sterilizing Zhou Tian Xin Yu's story and calling her the goddess of war and longevity, which is way less cool and not what she originally was. Having sexually empowered female goddesses did not in align with Taoism, nor did it vibe with the message that they wanted to send women of the Tang Dynasty, which is not cool, not TK approved. So for many years, Zhou Tianxin Yu was all but forgotten and became a minor deity, if that. But you can't keep a good goddess down for too long because in 1880, nope, absolutely not 18. In 1487, dyslexia showing up today. In 1487, when the Empress Xiao Qing Jing and Emperor Xiao Zong of Ming were ordained. And just a side note, because I thought this was really sweet, she is the only empress to an adult emperor who had no concubines in all of Chinese history. Her The, 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 the emperor took no concubines because he said he needed no others because he loved her so much. And I just... I just think that is incredible. In 4,000, almost 4,000 years of, of dynastic history in China, you're telling me that one, one adult emperor and empress couple didn't have concubines? Anyways, that's wild, but I will digress. So this absolute power couple was ordained. And when the empress was ordained, there was a scroll created to like certify that it had happened. And on the scroll, there were lots of pictures of goddesses and gods, as well as an inscription. And guess what was in the inscription? Our Lady of Darkness and Mystery. Yes. So the writer of the inscription, who was a Taoist master, Zheng, oh I'm so sorry, I could not find a pronunciation for this guy's name. Quan Jing, X-U-A-N-Q-I-N-G. Him. I'm so sorry, I could not find a pronunciation for this guy's name. He entitled our wonderful little sex and war goddess, the Dark Lady of the Nine Heavens, 
who slays evil and protects righteousness. He gave her that title to be immortalized in this scroll. In the end, she was not forgotten, and to this day, many Taoist practitioners call upon her when they're in the midst of their amorous congress, and other times, like when women are seeking to come into their power. And I hope next time that you are feeling not your best, you call upon Our Lady of Darkness and Mystery, who comes to us on the back of a phoenix, to get a little bit of courage. So now you know her, now you love her, Our Lady of the Nine Heavens, Slayer of Evil, and Protector of Righteousness, Zhou Tieng Sheng Yu. Well, dear one, we have come to our final thought, and this one is so odd and brief, but when I was researching in my rabbit hole, I came across a very interesting superstition tied to Our Lady of Darkness. So apparently it was a very big superstition back in the day that you couldn't marry someone with the same last name as you. I don't know why, but it was because of her. And in ancient China, there was like a whole law about it. Like it was a law. You were legally not allowed to marry someone with your last name. Maybe it was like incest prevention. I have no idea. But nowadays it's totally legal. However, there are still quite a few people who are a bit superstitious who still believe that you should not marry someone with your same last name because it's bad luck and somehow it's connected with Zhou Tian Sheng Yu. Uh, I don't know how, but it is. <laughs> We did it! We have finished episode 117 of For the Love of History podcast. I feel it in my nuggets that this season is going to be my favorite, and I'm, I'm legally allowed to say that every season. So, yeah, I hope you agree. <laughs> Thank you for joining me for this and every single episode, dear one. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you being here and spending time with me, telling you about some really weird stuff. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your history BFF or someone that you feel needs to be converted into a history BFF. Applications are always open. You can always come and join us. It would be absolutely fabulous if you left a rating or review or both. Uh, those help exponentially. The algorithm gods love those delicious little offerings and it makes them very happy and promotes the podcast for more potential delicious donuts. So that's great. And if you'd like to support the podcast in other ways, you can join us over on Patreon for early re episode releases, ad-free listening, Patreon-only author and guest interviews, recipes for all of the upcoming cooking history that will be going on over on YouTube, discounts on merch, discounts, goodness gracious, and so much more. You can also head over to For the Love of History merch store and get yourself some of the very adorable, very cool, very comfortable merch. We have new designs for season eight. And if you do end up getting some merch, uh, please take a picture of yourself in it uh, and tag me because I love seeing you in For the Love of History official gear. It, it makes my whole day. I love seeing my delicious donuts in their delicious donut merch. <laughs> and with that, I will say adieu. But before I go, I will tell you to do something kind for yourself. Go outside, touch some grass, take a little, a little time for yourself. Do something nice, drink some water, that's like I did right now. And with that, I will see you next week when we have our first author interview of the season. Okay, see you later, love you, bye! <laughs> Do you like my donut earrings? Can you see that they're donuts? Oh no, that's backwards. Where, where did it go? I'm a businesswoman in the Bronx. There it is. And it's pink for Valentine's. You're gonna, no. Tedalicious definition.
Not what Ted's made for. This is exactly what it, Ted is made for. <laughs> <laughs> Jyoti and Shen Yu testing, testing the mic. We're testing, we're testing the mic. Thank you, Nini. Thank you, friend. Ma'am. Thank you.